just um, put it in slideshow mode. So, so for the this the second presentation here, um, and this is a, a bit shorter. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a brief introduction into um, some of the work that we're doing with FNGAs and the Open Campy uh, interface. So we've actually designed a, a course uh, that is available for free uh, and, uh, and also uploaded a whole bunch of uh, lectures to, to YouTube. I, I think there's uh, you know, some, somewhere between 20 and 30 uh, short lectures available uh, there, uh, as well as some uh, uh, assignments and uh, there is a uh, a Docker container that 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 you can download um, and and uh, actually uh, you know do do, do the assignments and, and and you know realize the the things that I'll be talking about here. So um, I'll I'll talk a bit about uh, memory centric computing, you know, which seems a, a little bit su superfluous, but, but I'll, I'll explain what I mean there, uh, talk about benefits and challenges, addressing those challenges and so on. So, so with uh, big data analytics, what, one of the trends uh, that, you, that you may be uh, aware of is that um, you know, increasingly uh, for, for big data frameworks, we've moved to uh, data uh, that, is, that is shared not only between different components within the application, but between different applications, um, the data shared in, in memory. Now, you know, this is not entirely new. Um, I mean, we've had such things as in memory key value stores, Redis is, is uh, an example. Um, we've, we have in memory uh, databases. Um, so like uh, SAP HANA is, is one of the ones that you may be familiar with as well as uh, DB2. Uh, blue. Um, and uh, big data frameworks um, have also moved from being kind of storage and, and, and disk uh, formats uh, centric, you know, like, uh, like, like Hadoop with HDFS to uh, formats that are more memory centric, like, uh, like, like Spark uh, with, the, uh, with the RDDs. Um, so, uh, so this is not entirely new. Uh, but 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 there are some things that are novel. So so what we are pursuing here is actually uh, byte addressable memory that can be shared between applications, um, and, uh, and and where you can can pass uh, pointers around uh, a a collection of systems, not just within a, a single uh, OS image. And, and the memory here is not just a, a cache for a for a file system or a key value store, it's, it's actually, you know, random access, OS managed virtually addressable memory. Um, so, you know, what, what are the benefits of uh, pursuing such a thing? Well, first of all, uh, of course, you know, when you can, uh, with, with memory, unlike files, you have random access. Uh, an important one is um, uh, serialization and deserialization costs. Uh, so you run into this uh, in, an, in a number of cases. One of them is when you are trying to um, do something with, with data that may be held in memory, um, but, in a, uh, but, but may, may not be directly accessible by, say, an accelerator, like a, a GPU or an FPGA. And what you often have to do is not only copy the data to a buffer uh, that the uh, accelerator can access, uh, before the accelerator can operate on it, uh, you quite often have to transform the data uh, to a different format, um, you know, before you can do this. And that transformation can, uh, uh, you, you know, can cost you more than the speed up that the accelerator can uh, can provide in, in in at least some cases. Um, so. You know, not having device memory, actually having global shared memory between accelerators, and as you will see uh, shortly, even multiple nodes uh, allows for much more flexible integration and, uh, and, and efficiency. But it comes with uh, significant challenges. Uh, you know, there's a need for standard uh, APIs and, and, and a standardization of the formats in memory. Um, and you need on, not only software standards, you need hardware standards for uh, how to attach accelerators that can leverage this. Uh, putting more data in memory puts even more pressure on memory cost, which is already one of the 
uh, highest um, uh, you know costs in a, in a typical computer system um, and and you know as you move IO limitations out of the way uh, it's likely that you will become even more compute limited so I'll, I'll, I'll go over these standards sort of as uh, these challenges one one by one so first talking here about uh, having uh, data in memory in a standardized format so that you can uh, avoid having to uh, serialize or deserialize. Um, so I point out that there's a project, uh, an Apache project called Apache Arrow uh, that does this for uh, columnar uh, in, in memory uh, data. Uh, you know, this is a, a very active project as you can see there on the top right with, uh, you know, it's a, some, something like a, an, a, an average of, of close to 50 uh, contributions. Um, you know, every, every week. Um, it has bindings for many, uh, more than a dozen programming languages and many different projects uh, leverage Arrow either natively, like uh, Dremio, which is uh, kind of like Spark, but then with the Apache Arrow as its native uh, format. Uh, Fletcher, which is a project from uh, uh, Delft University. Uh, and, uh, I'm also affiliated with the, the group there. Uh, that takes Apache Arrow data and uh, brings it into uh, into FPGAs for FPGA kernels to to operate on it, uh, and and then as well as a a, a lot of uh, uh, you know ability of uh, you know frameworks to to convert data uh, into into and out of uh, Apache Arrow. There are also associated storage and network uh, formats, uh, Parquet for for. Uh, uh, you know, the file format and arrow flight uh, for an associated format on the on the on the network. So, so this is an example of of uh, you know how how one might be able to to address uh, the need to have data in a in a standardized format if you want to share in memory data between between different applications. Um, like I said, you not only need software standards, you need hardware standards as well. Um, so here, OpenCAPI is, uh, you know, and there's, this is an open standard, uh, OpenCAPI.org, just like OpenPower uh, Foundation is an organization that, uh, that maintains this standard. Um, and uh, we've had it in power processors now for, for some time, uh, and it will uh, likely uh, well, it, it's being followed by the industry uh, with a format called uh, CXL or Compute Express Link uh, that has many of the, the same uh, functionality that uh, OpenCAPI provides, but is built on uh, uh, kind of as an evolution of the, the PCI interface uh, standard. And it, it provides a distributed shared memory, uh, you know, for, for Gen Z, uh, for, for CXL even more so now that the uh, Gen C specifications have been donated into that project, uh, and and for OpenCAPI, I'll talk about something called Memory Inception, and uh, that does that. Um, shared virtual addressing and, and coherence are also provided by these uh, projects. So, you you may have heard of OpenCAPI, right? So OpenCAPI gives us the ability from an FPGA or uh, an other OpenCAPI compliant accelerator. Uh, to use an effective address, or you know, you can think virtual address, and access data uh, in in the system, um, you know, without these these uh, you know having to copy through uh, through buffers. And so, so how this works is, uh, you know, that you the effective address that you provide gets translated to a real address uh, through the same page table that addresses get translated uh, from you know if they came from one of the CPU ports. And, and based on that uh, on that mapping, uh, you may, uh, for example, end up going out over uh, a, a physical port to a particular memory bank that uh, maps a, a particular range of addresses, or a, a range of addresses may be uh, mapped to another uh, open CAPI interface. So what may memory inception adds, and this is a new functionality on Power 10, even though we, we did have a prototype uh, with FPGAs, uh, with open on Power 9 called uh, Timesis Flow, which is, by the way, also an open uh, open source project. Um, if if you if you have a, an ability to map a real address back to a virtual address range, 
uh, now you can turn your CPU into a, into a router. Uh, and, and Power 10, uh, I, you know, I don't have time to go uh, deep into what Power 10 is, but let me just mention that it has a terabyte per second of uh, memory bandwidth from the processor, as well as a terabyte per second of uh, uh, bandwidth on the, uh, on, on, on the configurable interconnect. So, so as a router, you know, this is actually quite a, quite a powerful approach. So what you can do then with memory inception is organize systems, say, for example, for cloud, uh, where you have uh, disaggregated memory. So in this particular example, this server, um, you, you know, has a workload that requires a lot more memory than is provided on this server alone and, and leveraging memory, memory inception. Uh, you could arrange it to steal memory from, uh, from, from other servers, uh, which has a, a cost benefit because you don't have to configure every server with the maximum amount of memory that you might need. Um, you know, you can, uh, uh, you know, get much, much better uh, memory utilization. Um, and another thing you could do is use one of our scale-up servers. Uh, Power 10 scale-up server goes all the way to uh, supports up to 64 terabytes of uh, DRAM memory. Um, and, and you could use uh, one of these scale-up servers as a, as a memory server, uh, just like you might be familiar with storage servers. In this case, you, know, you have a memory server. And uh, use other systems uh, as, uh, as compute nodes that access that, uh, that large shared pool of memory. And you can even, you know, couple multiple systems together. Uh, in theory, this could go up to uh, as much as a, as a petabyte. I think the uh, Power 10 supports an address range of all the way up, physical address range, all the way up to two petabytes. Um, and, and you can repeat this trick more than once, right? So going from a, from a virtual address to a real address uh, and then map it back to a virtual address that uh, another server uh, can interpret is a, a trick that you can repeat. And if you think about it for a while, you can imagine how you might even uh, organize a set of address ranges for a, for a cluster so that, you know, if you pick the appropriate address range, you end up, you know, in, in the target server. Now, <coughs> so your load store instructions, of course, are going to take uh, longer latency, you know, the more hops you make. In, in the order of, uh, I think, 150 nanoseconds or so per, per hop. So, uh, you know, you, you, you do have to be careful about, uh, about how many hops uh, you take. Uh, and, and there was a prototype, there is a prototype of this on, on Power9, as I, as I mentioned. So to the last challenge that I'll mention is, uh, um, you know, that, that as we move uh, storage and network bandwidth limitations out of the way, uh, you know, the, the, the CPU is more likely to become uh, the, the bottleneck, right? And on Power 10, we have a, a number of different acceleration units, um, but, uh, but we need, you know, we will likely need more uh, forms of acceleration and efficient compute as we go forward. So, so FPGAs are a great way to experiment with this. Uh, I mentioned the Fletcher project, um, you know, you can, it is an open project and you can see it, uh, the, the web page for it here. And basically what it does is you can give a schema for one of these Apache Arrow uh, tabular structures in memory, and then uh, Fletcher will generate an interface for you uh, that you can plug a core, uh, a kernel into so that on the FPGA uh, you can exit uh, uh, compute that. So, so this kind of technology is what we actually cover in that uh, accelerating big data uh, class. So here's an uh, overview of the modules, right? So uh, in much greater depth than I was able to do here, it uh, provides the architecture background and an introduction um, uh, to, um, to in-memory processing, acceleration, shared memory, uh, open copy, uh, Apache Arrow, et cetera. And then we also go into a number of examples from uh, uh, genomics and uh, X-ray processing data. Um, and the course ma material can be accessed here. Again, I'll, I've made these slides uh, available to, uh, to Canessa, and I hope he can make them available to you. Okay, so with that, I'll stop.
And yep, indeed, I, I try to leave a, a few minutes uh, for, for questions. And uh, uh, if, if there are any, I'd be happy to answer them. Uh, Thank you, Professor uh, Peter. Um, I, I got some questions, text from some of my colleagues. Uh, okay, uh, the CAPI is as such implemented as a function inside the CPU, right? No, so, so the, the, the CAPI um, interface is a, uh, an external interface on the, on the power chip. Um, so um, so we, we, we started with uh, uh, CAPI 1.0 on, uh, on power eight. And in that case, we actually ran this CAPI protocol with virtual addresses uh, on top of uh, PCIe data packets. So, um, you know, you, you could uh, uh, bring up the, the, the interface and then, um, you, you know, it, 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 was, it, was not, it was not as efficient as it is now because we had to kind of encapsulate the, uh, the CAPI protocol on, 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 on data packets with PCIe. Uh, but it was it was handled in hardware, and then we went to uh, in in Power Nine. We went to PCIe Gen Four from Gen Three in Power Eight, uh, but we also introduced the Open Copy interface, which is in uh, using the same uh, protocol, uh, but does it over a uh, a set of links that is uh, uh, a, actually a, a a link that goes up to uh, twenty five point six. Uh, gigabit per second per pair. So it's uh, typically a byte wide uh, link. So you get up to 25 gigabytes per second theoretical peak over that link. And in reality, we were able to drive uh, 21, 22 gigabytes per second of, of bandwidth over a single uh, open copy interface. Uh, and in, in uh, Power 10, you know, that, that interface uh, is designed on the chip to go, to go all the way up to even uh, 32. Uh, gigabit per second. So it's it, a. It, it is a part of the processor. It's a part of the processor, yeah. And and uh, power, uh, power nine and power ten systems uh, typically will have a, a few open copy ports in them. Um, you know, my my students in Delft use uh, an, uh, an an IBM IC nine twenty two. Yeah. Uh, but the, but the AC nine twenty two uh, the. The interface is there, you know, if, if, you, if you take a, um, the uh, NVLink interface, you know, where you normally would, would maybe plug in an NVIDIA GPU, you can put a little uh, adapter card and then, uh, you know, you have a, a few open copy interfaces there as well. Uh, uh, we have a AC922 and we are in the process of purchasing one IC922 as well. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, the IC922, it's, it's a little bit more... Uh, elegant and yeah, the, the uh, IBM Ireland Research Lab, uh, Delft University, uh, and also the uh, Hassel Plattner Institute, you know, have been working together on this uh, Dynesis Flow uh, technology that I that I discussed, which which is um, you, you know uh, first first set of steps on on uh, disaggregated memory. And one other question, how does an NVLink and the CAPI uh, complement each other? Yeah, 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 yeah. So op open CAPI and NVLink is, is actually physically the same set of, uh, the, same, the same set of interfaces. So, um, you, you know, we, we, uh, we, we had to come up with a, with a different interface than NVLink uh, because NVLink is, uh, you know, you, you're, you're only allowed to use it with NVIDIA processors, you know, and we wanted an open standard. Yeah. Uh, so we defined open copy uh, as a as an open standard that was complementary to uh, to to what we what we did with Nvidia. Um, yeah, but it's 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 very similar technology also with Nvidia, right? We wanted to have shared memory between the GPUs and the, and the CPUs on uh, on the AC nine twenty two. Yeah. yeah. Uh, any questions from the participants? Hello. A couple of questions. Anyone else who has got a question? I, I, I see a question in the room. <laughs> yeah, so I think somebody had their ways there. Sir, is it possible to integrate it with any open source tool available for big data? Yeah, I mean, I mean, so um, of course, an, an, an accelerator 
typically requires its own uh, programming. But um, um, you, you know what, what? What I find interesting is that that if you use effective addresses, then uh, it becomes a lot, a lot more, in, uh, a lot easier uh, to to do integration. So uh, I, I can give uh, two two examples. Uh, one, one of the first things that we did uh, with the uh, the CAPI interface is we built an, an, an FPGA for uh, regular expression acceleration, which was actually used for uh, accelerating something called uh, System T, which was an IBM uh, text annotation uh, 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 you know, language. And you know, FPGAs are really, really good at uh, regular expression evaluation. Uh, but of course, an FPGA is of uh, finite size, right? So it's always possible to write uh, a, a regular expression and actually this system T language uh, called the AQL in included uh, other things like dictionary lookups and, and other functionality. Um, and, and you could specify it in such a way that it couldn't fit on the FPGA, right? An FPGA is a finite size kind of device. So what we were able to do was uh, uh, you know, very flexibly, um, you know, handle the, 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 the part of the uh, operator graph that would fit in the FPGA in the FPGA and actually handle the rest on the, on the, on the CPU. If, if you don't have shared addressing, that, that kind of thing becomes very, very difficult to do. Uh, another example is, um, you know, some of my, my colleagues in, in Germany I think uh, it designed an accelerator for, uh, for DB2, uh, for the database. And um, so now you have an application with millions of lines of code. And somewhere in the middle of this application, you have a hot function, right? And you want to uh, implement it on an accelerator. And typically what you have to do, if, if you want to do this is because the accelerator uh, does not live in the, in the shared address space with the CPU, you have to, you have to know every, everything that might get dereferenced and ensure that it's reachable, you know, from, from the accelerator, which can lead you to have to restructure, you know, very large applications. Whereas if you are able to share effective addresses or virtual addresses, you know, as we do, then again, in principle, I can dive in the middle of a very, very large piece of code, you know, uh, take a function call, just pass a stack pointer over to the accelerator, it, it can take the operands, you know, from, from, the, uh, from the stack to its thing uh, and return. And I, I don't actually have to, I, I don't have to restructure my program. You know, I'm, I might still worry about, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't want the, the, the accelerator to, to reach out, you know, too many times maybe because of, of, of just performance and efficiency. Just from a functionality point of view, uh, a processor that I would have, you know, on, on the accelerator or a piece of hardware that does the equivalent thing, uh, you know, is is very easily integrated. And, and and similarly, I guess this is the third example. <laughs> I'll leave it there. You know, with with Timesis flow, but when I show these examples of you know stealing a bunch of memory from from other servers, right? The application doesn't isn't isn't any the wiser. You know, to it, it just. You know, it, it just looks like memory. It may have a little bit extra latency, but you access it with the same load store instructions that you would insert, use it, uh, access it if it if it were on the on the processor itself. So yes, I think it's uh, you know a, a lot easier to, uh, to to integrate. One last question before we wind up this session, Peter. Uh, one uh, question from uh, Mr. Kiran Mehta that uh, does an application developer need to be made conscious of possible slowdowns when memory inception kicks in? Yeah, so, so, so that, that I, I kind of alluded to it a little bit. Um, so I, I think the first thing I would point out is that the amount of additional delay, right? If you fetch the memory from a, uh, you, you know, crossing a, a memory inception link, and I, I mentioned, I think it's probably in the order of uh, another 150 nanoseconds or so, you know, for an additional hop. Um, in, in principle, isn't any different than uh, if you have a, 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 big, uh, a big SMP, right? So in, in IBM, we build SMPs up to 16 sockets. 
and the Power 10 SMP, uh, you, you actually you can you, you might have to make two hops, you know, to get to the to the memory uh, in in that in that SMP. So you, you know, of, of course, the the um, you know while, while you can get to a very big memory space that way, uh, your your latency is going to be higher than if you uh, if you if you get it locally. Um, so. Um, you know, you have to have the right mechanisms in your hardware to do things like prefetching and so on, right? To cover that latency, and you have you do have to be careful that you don't take too many hops. Um, but uh, but but yes, I I, do, I really uh, do believe that this is uh, quite uh, practical, and and even with thymesis flow, you know, be, which which of course is still still more latency because we have uh, uh, FPGAs in the middle that that you don't have to have in the middle in power ten. Uh, so that's uh, latency somewhere under a, a microsecond. Uh, we were able to uh, to saturate the, the, the link band you know, with, with load uh, load store instructions uh, in that case as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peter. Pleasure. Yeah, you have. Done thank you, Dr. Uh, talk uh, and you have you have you have just covered the power architecture, the CAPI, uh, the A2 FPGA board design to uh, big data on power. So yeah. this limited time, uh, you have covered more. Yeah, I know it was a, a, a whirlwind, but, but hopefully, you know, from the many links that I provided, uh, people who are interested. Can, uh, and I'm sure that uh, the participants uh, would have really enjoyed the talk. And uh, thank you very much for your time, especially during a Sunday evening. And I really thank uh, the team IBM and uh, the uh, organizers of this workshop uh, for, for making it possible to have uh, you on board on this particular discussion. Thank you very much. My uh, pleasure. Ladies, please give a big round of applause to uh, Dr. Peter. My pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for the good questions and the attention. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.